beginning, there was nothing. Somehow, out of this nothing, came everything. Out of this vibrant nothingness. How is it that something as unconscious as the matter of the brain can ever give rise to something as immaterial as an experience? If you want to see fear in a quantum physicist's eyes, just mention the words, the measurement problem. The measurement problem is this. An atom only appears in a particular place if you measure it. In other words, an atom is spread out all over the place until a conscious observer decides to look at it. So the act of measurement or observation creates the entire universe. Only conscious beings can be observers, then we're intimately hooked in to the very existence of reality. Without us, there would just be this expanding superposition of possibilities with nothing definite ever actually happening. Out of millions and millions of blobs of energy and light, photons and electrons, they make up this uh, imaginary three-dimensional solid world which doesn't exist at all according to uh, relativity or quantum mechanics. Anytime we attempt to look at particles beyond a certain level, the very act of observation changes things. And in addition, the more you look at individual particles, the more you realize that there is no such thing as one electron. An electron or any elementary particle exists only in relationship to other things, like other particles or, or the universe at large. This means that, that deeply enough, when you de dive down into the nature of matter, Everything we know about the, the everyday world dissolves. There are no objects anymore. There are only relationships. There's no locality anymore. There's no time anymore. The more you look at something in detail, in what we think of as solid matter, the less and less solid it begins to look. The only realities we know are the ones our brain manufactures. Our brain receives millions of signals every minute, and we organize them into holograms, which we project outside ourselves and call reality. Well, if the brain cortex, uh, if it is also a hologram, then it's a three-dimensional hologram. If two-dimensional holograms reconstruct three-dimensional images, then, ergo, it follows that three-dimensional holograms reconstruct a hologram is a metaphor. It is how you take n dimensions of information and you bring them down into n minus one dimensions. It's a way of relating the paradoxes that we find in how to make a leap from this concept to that concept. The conceptual pigeonholes we use, words, to, to describe reality are phenomena inside our head. They're not out there. And most of the time, this is a philosophical quibble. When, but when you get down to quantum physics, and this is one of the reasons that Bohm came up with the holographic idea, it, it starts to have real effects. And one of those is it's been discovered that if you take uh, two subatomic particles like electrons, in certain instances, when you do something to one, it will always affect the other, no matter how far apart they are. Well, how can this be? But what this tells us is that once matter is physically joined, even when it becomes separate, the energy is still there that's connecting it. And this is why it's important to me, because if we go back far enough in time, all the particles of matter of this entire universe that are expanding were all meshed together in a single particle about the size of a green pea, is what scientists tell us today, is what the computer models suggest. That if you could go into the universe today and take all the particles of matter and take out all the space in between and bring it together and compress it, into the size of a single green pea, it means that you and me and every one of our listeners, we were all once part of that same particle that creates this whole universe today. And even though those particles are now separate and expanding, and, and studies show that they are, energetically we're all still linked. So an atom and its electron are multiversal objects. And that multiversal object is what the quantum mechanics is describing. Now, that means that the parallel universe aspect of reality, as described by quantum theory, must apply to objects of all sizes, humans, stars, galaxies, everything. And that's why we call it the parallel universe theory, rather than just parallel electrons theory. 
because we ourselves are made of atoms after all. We are, and, and uh, that's right. And the same theory that says that the atoms exist in more than one place in different universes says that we humans also exist in more than one place and in more than one state of mind and so forth in different universes. And so what that means, talking about words, is that there is no separation between electrons. Furthermore, there's no separation between people. Everything is interconnected. And the biggest secret of all, to me, is the extent to which individuality is an illusion. The big thing we're talking about here is a new way of thinking about this thing we call the person, the self, the beingness, the I. And as we begin to modify what we mean by that, we can begin to see and touch upon this infinite realm that I'm speaking about. Infinities are part of the boundary of your existence. That is, viewed from this perspective, Everything can be divided to infinity. If you've ever wondered why nuclear power is a million times more powerful than chemical energy, it's because chemical energy results from the manipulation of atoms in a molecule. Nuclear energy results from the manipulation of nucleons in a nucleus. The super unified scale, a thousand, million, million, million times smaller, is virtually infinite in its dynamism. Science is involved in a perceptual enterprise, not, in, not primarily in gaining knowledge, though knowledge appears, but knowledge is a byproduct. And by understanding the thing, you can coherently, then our contact with it, as long as it is coherent, it shows that our understanding is correct. You see, we must distinguish between correct appearances and incorrect appearances or illusory. Your appearance now is what we call residual self-image. It is the mental projection of your digital self. This, this is real. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. Our brains take information in and sometimes give it a form it's not that the picture is out there, it's that we're getting data that we're turning into a picture according to our own belief systems and our own unconscious belief systems as well. We know what is going on is that light comes in through the eyes, hits the back of the retina, triggers electrochemical impulses which travel down nerve fibers to the back of the brain, where the brain very cleverly, in about a tenth of a second, puts it all together and says, this is what it looks like out there. Well, uh, you're creating your own reality tunnel. That doesn't mean you're creating reality. Uh, out, out of reality, whatever that is, out of the infinite flux of energy, you're creating your own uh, reality tunnel, and uh, uh, most people aren't aware of it. Most people aren't aware of it. All matter is merely energy condensed to a slow vibration that we are all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. There is no such thing as death. Life is only a dream, and we are the imagination of ourselves.